or you know people missed out on this uh you can reach out to myself or sierra um to and we'll be happy to send it out um sierra the vice president did a lot of the hard work getting this organized and coordinated and so uh, i'll hand it off to her to do some introductions Thanks, Matt. So as Matt said, my name is Sierra Summel. I'm the vice president of our HRC chapter of VFS. So thank you so much for joining today. This luncheon was open to members and non-members, but if you are not a member, I highly encourage you to join. There are many opportunities open to VFS members. Um, this is also a great networking tool allowing you to meet other professionals in your area so if you are interested in being becoming a member feel free to visit the bfs website uh, or contact me for more information uh, with all of that our guest speaker today will be miss susan gordon Ms. susan gordon has been with nasa for 22 years and has been the nasa revolutionary vertical lift technology project lead for the past 15 years before joining, joining NASA, she was a researcher in the Army's Aeroflight Dynamics Directorate, uh, now known as Technology Development Directorate. So Ms. Gorton has a Bachelor of Science in Aerospace Engineering from the University of Illinois and a Master of Science in Auto Aeronautics from the George Washington University. Ms. Susan Gordon has authored or co-authored over 85 publications, and she is the recipient of many awards including the nasa outstanding leadership medal the nasa exceptional achievement medal the army civilian service medal the army research and development award and the university of illinois outstanding alumna award and the vfs augusta westland international fellowship award she is an honorary fellow of the vfs organization and an associate fellow of the aiaa so thank you miss gordon for joining us today uh, at the end of the presentation, we'll have some time for questions. Please put your questions in the chat box throughout and uh, we'll go through them at the very end. Uh, with all of that said, I'll go ahead and, and turn it over to you now, Ms. Susan Gordon. All right, thanks, Sierra. Um, really done a great job setting this up. So uh, I want to give, give my thanks to you too for making uh, this possible and making it possible to so many people even outside our chapter area. So I'll also echo uh, what Sierra said, if you're not a member of VFS, it's a great organization and has a lot of benefits. So uh, you can contact any of us about, about joining. So what you all signed in to hear today uh, was the is the uh, overview, a very quick overview of the NASA's Advanced Air Mobility Mission, uh, highlighting some of our activities in the vertical flight arena. And then uh, I included a featured guest cameo appearance from our newest star on Mars, the Mars Helicopter Ingenuity. So I will go through about 10 slides on the NASA's Advanced Air Mobility Mission and then have some slides at the end that talk about Ingenuity, which has been a really, really exciting week for us uh, here at NASA. So we'll start first closer to home down on Earth, uh, looking at NASA Aeronautics and the emphasis of NASA Aeronautics in six strategic thrust areas. So these range from safe, efficient growth in global operations, which is really a concentration on airspace and operations in the airspace, supersonic aircraft and flight with supersonic commercial supersonic transports, a big emphasis uh, historically in ultra efficient subsonic transport. So that's the, the classic uh, uh, high performance subsonic transportation. And our newest thrust is safe, quiet and affordable vertical lift air vehicles. And this is where our vertical flight research really comes in. So it's, it's being highlighted at the top levels of NASA strategic policy and thrusts, and it's really a step up for us in terms of the acknowledgement of the contributions of vertical flight. The goal there is to realize extensive use of vertical lift vehicles for transportation and services, and particularly emphasizing new missions and markets. And that is the emphasis and focus of NASA's uh, research here. It's in the new missions and markets. We also have work in what we call in time safety wide 
uh, system-wide safety assurance, and that is looking at how you collect in a big data kind of way safety risks in the aviation system, and assured autonomy for aviation transformation. So some work in autonomy and how does autonomous and uh, uh, applications impact aviation. If you're interested in more information on the strategic implementation plan, you can go to, to this website and there's a document outlining these uh, six strategic thrusts. As well, the National Academies last year uh, released a study on advancing aerial mobility that also ties into our thrust number four for a safe, quiet, and affordable vertical lift vehicles. So if we drill down into that a little on the focus for advanced air mobility. So first of all, we talk about what is that? We've been talking about both advanced air mobility and urban air mobility. And advanced air mobility are missions that are about less than 300 nautical miles, so fairly short range. We expect that these kind of vehicles will require increased automation over today's uh, configurations, and they're likely electric or hybrid electric. So that's a distinguishing feature of an, of an advanced air mobility vehicle. Rural and urban operations, uh, as well as cargo delivery, are included in this broad category of missions. And so urban air mobility is really a subset of this advanced air mobility, but it's a segment that is projected to have the most economic benefit. So the, the rewards are very high. However, it's also the most difficult to develop. It requires a vehicle that's capable of operating safely in an urban area. It requires an airspace system that can handle high density operations. So there are a lot of challenges in developing the urban air mobility market as part of the advanced air mobility mission. So what NASA has uh, said that we'll do is provide uh, a framework and establish an, uh, an architecture and system framework for the aircraft, the airspace, and infrastructure in order to enable these scalable medium density operations for advanced air mobility. We have a lot more words in our statements. We have our vehicle development and operations piece of this. We have our airspace design and operations piece of this. And we have the community integration. How do we actually move this technology into the community and get public acceptance, get infrastructure development? And we know that this will require our activities, such as the national campaign series that I'll talk about. It requires an ecosystem partnership model with communities, with local regulatory, uh, regulatory agencies, and it requires us to execute in our research portfolio. So what that means for us in the, in the projects and the people working on this commitment is, for example, my project, Revolutionary Vertical Lift Technology, will deliver enabling vehicle technologies. The airspace projects that NASA uh, supports will be uh, focusing on the airspace design and operations. We have working groups, and if you're interested in joining any of these working groups, you can go to the uh, website listed here and join one of the ecosystem working groups. They're open to everyone. We have regular community uh, working groups that uh, that talk about the different topics. And if you're interested more in finding out more about the national campaign, we do have a website for more information on that as well. So these are the main areas where we're working in our advanced air mobility mission. And when we talk about the national campaign, this is a series of demonstrations where NASA is partnering with vehicle partners, with airspace providers, and with uh, infrastructure uh, uh, entities to 
demonstrate the ability to integrate these three things together. So we're starting with the national campaign demonstration test. Uh, that will happen this May, June. Uh, we're going to be flying with a vehicle partner, Joby, at Fort Hunter Liggett, and we'll be demonstrating some of the components of this. Next year, we'll be moving to our national campaign, the first, the first one in the series. We expect that to fly sometime in the summer of 2022. We've just had a solicitation for partners and we're evaluating the input that we got. And then in the tw probably 2024 timeframe, we'll have the second of that national campaign series and then have two more events that are uh, further along than 2024. Primarily people, uh, entities propose to be our partners, and then we look at what the proposals are. We try to integrate those across the vehicles, the airspace partners, and the infrastructure partners. And the primary test ranges are determined by the locations where the partners want to fly. So we come to them and uh, help to try to make these integ integrated demonstrations work. The primary place where we're getting input into what should be demonstrated and how this should happen and the different uh, challenges that are associated with advanced air mobility is in this working group series. So if you are interested, please sign up, join our working groups, or at least get on the email list for that. Going into the, more of the details of what the Revolutionary Vertical Lift Technology Project addresses, that's, again, the piece that's providing the vehicle technologies for the advanced air mobility mission. So we have work at four of NASA's research centers, Ames at Moffett Field, California, Armstrong a Flight Research Center uh, near Edwards Air Force Base in the Mojave Desert, Glenn Research Center in Cleveland, Ohio, and Langley Research Center in Hampton, Virginia. And at each of these different research centers, we take advantage of the unique skills and uh, facility capabilities for those centers. Uh, in many cases, you'll see, for example, like all of our icing work is done at NASA Glenn. Um, most of our impact dynamics is done at NASA Langley with Summit Glenn. Most of our acoustics is done at Langley. As you can see, we have Summit Glenn and Summit Ames. So we work across the centers, taking advantage again of those skills and the facilities to have a very cohesive research program. It's about uh, 110 people, it's about $33 million a year. Now, one of the challenges that we have with this new uh, emerging market is that these vehicles uh, all look very different from what we're used to. They also all look very different from each other in a lot of cases. There's no single standard that has emerged in this marketplace. So what NASA's done is to try to develop what we call our reference vehicles that are NASA designs. They're not intended to be the best, the most efficient, the, uh, the greatest thing. What they're intended to do is to capture the characteristics of many of these vehicles in a handful of reference configurations. These, these uh, designs are open, they're widely shared. We fully document what assumptions that we made. We try to insert realistic performances and compromises. But I want to emphasize we've got no plans to build or fly these concepts, right? We're not trying to do a flying demonstrator. There's lots of other people doing flying demonstrators. What we're trying to do is to capture the relevant features of these technologies and to provide these configurations so we can communicate our research so that we can coordinate across the disciplines within NASA our research. We can target certain uh, areas that need to be developed. We can assess where our tools need improvement for design and analysis. We can do trade studies for the different configurations. And they give us really this a, a common configuration 
across not just our disciplines, but even our projects. So airspace can, for their simulations, can use the same kind of vehicles that we're using uh, for some of the performance evaluations. So you can uh, see these different configurations are documented in several Vertical Flight Society papers and NASA publications. And um, I believe will be kind of up featured in one of the, the upcoming Vertical uh, Flight Society forum in a couple of weeks as well. Now, one of the things that using concept vehicles like this has done for us is that if we look across this wide variety of platforms, different things that look really different from each other that operate differently, we were able to uh, focus on areas that were generic, that generically applied to all configurations where we needed work. Where, and that's where we concentrated our NASA portfolio. So that we identified, for example, in, in terms of propulsion efficiency, put investment into light efficient high speed electric motors because research in that area can apply to all these configurations and it helps all these configurations. So this is how we've identified our pre-competitive research areas. So you can look at the list of things from performance, rotor-rotor interactions, a lot of work in noise and annoyance, structures and air elasticity, design, operational effectiveness and safety and airworthiness. What I've highlighted in red are the primary areas where we have investment within NASA. And what is in blue are areas where we have a secondary type investment. And the black are areas where we know there should be investment, but we don't have any right now. So that's a gap area. And, and we use that to say, OK, what should we look at next? Where should our next uh, investment be? So for the near term, you know, and obviously we're all impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. But for since uh, FY20 through about FY23, we are working in the areas of vehicle propulsion reliability, looking at addressing the reliable and efficient propulsion components for UAM. So really targeting the electric and hybrid electric configurations. We're reconfiguring our labs. We're looking to develop tools and uh, do testing, especially to determine uh, things like operations under faults and how to assess reliability. We'll take those that information and work with standards organizations in order to provide them data for means of compliance for certification. So we're trying to get those fundamentals in place that then can be used to, to help develop this market. The second area we're working hard is uh, how to predict the operational fleet noise for urban air mobility vehicles. These vehicles will be operating not in an airport. They'll be operating close in to people. And so we need to uh, find a way to generate the noise footprint of that kind of fleet of operation in the urban environment. Uh, we also are doing psychoacoustic research to assess how humans respond to these vehicles. They're a different sound, but are they more or less annoying? The third area that we're working hard is noise and performance. And this relates to the, the fleet noise assessment. We have to be able to predict the noise of the configuration. But here we're looking at, can we predict the, the noise of a vehicle accurately? And can we trade off the noise and performance characteristics in a design environment for the vehicles? We also realized that a lot of the tools that we're using within NASA are not easy to use. And we're looking at how can we improve the community transition and training for these tools to really get them out to the community to be able to be used. And the last area that we're working hard is uh, really targeting safety and acceptability for the configuration, building on our history for crashworthiness and occupant protection, looking at acceptable handling and ride qualities, and how does ice accretion and shedding impact UAM performance and safety. 
Now, this is our focus in the vehicle sector for the advanced air mobility, urban air mobility area. So I'm going to summarize this kind of section on the advanced air mobility. So overall within NASA Aeronautics, advanced air mobility is one of the priorities for aeronautics research. Uh, we are working on vehicle, uh, vertical lift vehicle technology supporting urban air mobility. That's a subset of the advanced air mobility. We are working on airspace technologies for advanced air mobility in our airspace projects. We have the national campaign demonstrations that are starting up. And we have ecosystem working groups that are running. So again, I encourage you to, to join those. Within our particular project, Revolutionary Vertical Lift Technology, we're focused on research and technology to improve noise and safety as a general category. And our vision is looking to the future where we can see these configurations operate quietly, safely, routinely as part of everyone's everyday life. So that's our, our vision for what things will look like in the future here on Earth. But if we look at what's happening uh, on another planet, right? Uh, we'll talk a little bit here now about the Ingenuity Mars helicopter. Uh, I'll refer you also to mars.nasa.gov. They are posting all the images, the videos, the audio sounds uh, from the Mars mission Perseverance and Ingenuity at mars.nasa.gov. And they are giving updates about when the next flight will be. Um, I believe it's going to be Sunday, uh, Sunday morning. But I, I encourage you to go to that website. So that's the best place to get information on, on what's going on right now. So if you missed it, uh, let me maybe. Play this video. So this is video of the Mars helicopter first flight. Uh, the video was captured by the Mars rover, which was about 250 feet away from the helicopter. So it, it rises to about three meters. It makes a 90 uh, degree turn. It hovers for about, uh, overall, the whole flight is about 39 seconds. It does experience some wind, and then it lands. So that was an amazing moment uh, for us uh, as we watched that video that, that had been transmitted from Mars um, back to Earth. There, there is video on the website that shows an enhancement of that flight and with the di digital enhancement you can see the effect of dust that you can't really see in just the uh the regular video but that that video the enhancement is on the website so i want to say congratulations to the mars helicopter team uh, this was comprised of uh, three different nasa mission directorates the science mission directorate has the mars exploration program the Aeronautics Mission Directorate is, is where uh, the Revolutionary Vertical Lift Technology Program is. And then we have the Science Technology Mission Directorate. So you can see a big team at, at JPL. JPL is the lead for the Mars helicopter. Uh, we had team members at both NASA Ames and NASA Langley, as well as the huge contributions from the contractors, Aero Environment, Qualcomm, Sola Aero, uh, Lockheed Martin, really to make this work. The timeline of the events, you know, it seems like to some people that the helicopter sort of uh, came out of nowhere, but uh, in actual fact, it was proposed uh, in December of 2014, well, 20. 
in 2014, they showed the feasibility that they thought they could lift, make, provide enough lift in the Mars environment. They demonstrated this in a vacuum chamber. And that was at JPL. And the helicopter in the vacuum chamber didn't, did not perform quite like they thought it should. So they contacted the Revolutionary Vertical Lift Technology Project uh, in a, about a month after that demonstration. So here's, here's uh, us getting together for the first meeting in January 2015 at NASA Ames. Um, and so a small team from our project engaged with JPL and with Air Environment to uh, see how we could make improvements in the performance, in the controls of, of Ingenuity. And so in May 2016, we had a proof of concept helicopter uh, control flight demonstration. And what was going on in the background was that we had key gates to make it through. If we, we had to prove that we could make this helicopter work before NASA would give the actual approval to try it on Mars. So in January of 2018, that's when we had the engineering development model helicopter flight demonstration. And that's the one that really cleared the gates. And so in May of 2018, it was announced that we were baselined onto Mars 2020. And what that means is baselining onto that mission means you're going to Mars. Now get ready because you have to make a launch date. So starting in May of 2018, uh, for the next about eight to 10 months, we worked really hard in getting the flight model Mars helicopter ready for Mars. Because there's a lot of things that have to happen in order to, it's not just about flying and performance, it's about how are you accommodate, how are you accommodated on the rover? Can you survive the launch loads? Can you survive the vibration? Can you survive the temperature? Has everything been tested to space flight hardware standards? So all of that work was done with JPL team is amazing at, at, at doing the, that kind of work. And so the test with the 2020 Mars helicopter delivery system was in 20 is in May of, of 2019. That's how, how are we going to stow it onto the rover and then how does it get off the rover? And then it was integrated into the 2020 rover and launched in July. So really uh, six, it, it took us about six years, right? To go from showing the feasibility to launch. So the helicopter design is a coaxial helicopter. The atmosphere on Mars is 1% of Earth's atmosphere. So it's like flying at, at 100,000 feet. Uh, the blades have to be very, you have to have a lot of lifting area and we spin them very fast, about 2,500 RPM to generate enough lift uh, on Mars. The size of it is about four feet tip to tip. It weighs about four pounds and the, the body of it is about the size of a, of a tissue box. Uh, it can fly one flight per day up to about 90 seconds. It has to recharge over a two day period because it the the batteries also run the heaters at night to keep it to keep it warm. The flight range is up to 300 meters and heights about five meters. Now the first flight went to three meters, but the second flight yesterday went to five meters. The flight Sunday will also is targeted to go to five meters. It's completely autonomous. Now there's a delay between Earth and Mars, so you can't control this with a joystick and you, you can't go out there and make any changes to it if it doesn't work. So it, it has, its instructions are communicated through the rover. The rover then communicates to the helicopter and that's how we also get the pictures back from the helicopter. Um, but it has to be fully autonomous. So we upload the instructions for the flight and then it executes them. And we're on Earth waiting to find out if the instructions we sent, what happened? Because 
it's already happened by the time we get the information back. So we're just waiting to see what happened. Um, as I said, it gets down to about minus 120 degrees Fahrenheit at night at Mar on Mars. So everything is uh, in, a, in a box that keeps, uh, keeps the systems warm. And um, then, then we're able to, to charge up during the Martian day and, uh, and fly. Now, as I mentioned, the configuration has to be able to be accommodated on the rover. So there's actually the helicopters installed here on the bottom of the rover, and it's right here. Hard to see because the coaxial system, that's one of the benefits of it, is it, it folds into a very compact system. You can see there's the solar panel and the fuselage, and everything is tucked up in there, and then a debris shield was um, put over this uh, to protect it during the the launch, during the entry, descent, and landing, and then during the rover initial operations. So it had a really great launch. Uh, you, uh, there were quite there were three missions that launched to Mars in the July time frame because that is the time frame that happens once every two years when the Earth and Mars are closest to each other. So China, the United Arab Emirates, and uh, United States all launched missions to Mars uh, that same month. We landed in February uh, of 2021, and these are some of the images from Mars. So this top image is the rover dropping off the helicopter. So it's unfolded its legs, it's rotated down, and it's going to drop it from this attachment at point at the top. Then the rover will drive away. The rover never picks back up the helicopter. They never come back together. The rover stays far away from the helicopter. And that's by design. Uh, we really, in case there was an issue with the helicopter, we did not want uh, anything to happen to the rover. The, this is a photo of the helicopter before the, the blades were uh, separated, just ready to wiggle them. This is what they called a selfie image of the rover with the helicopter in the background on Mars. This image is uh, from the, the first flight and this image, the black and white, is from the helicopter looking down. You can see the leg of the helicopter up in this upper image. So this is uh, a, a view of the camera, the navigation camera that's on the helicopter looking down during the first flight. So uh, again, this is a, a spectacular uh, image that we were really excited to see. So the helicopter is a technology demonstrator. It's not part of the Perseverance Science mission. Its sole purpose is to demonstrate that we can fly on Mars. Its sole purpose is to show uh, that we understand enough and know how to test and design here on Earth and can, can do this on Mars so that we can then make the next uh, vehicle that's going to Mars uh, more capable, make it be more of a partner to the rover. So the demonstration milestones were to survive the launch and the cruise to Mars and that landing, very dramatic landing uh, on Mars, to then deploy to the Martian surface and unfold correctly, you know, to keep warm uh, through the, the cold nights. So the first couple of days we were watching to see if the heaters worked properly if we had the right uh, thermal management system. Could we charge autonomously with the solar panel? Was everything working? And then communicate with the rover and then to the flight operators on Earth. We were able to spin up the blades for the first time to about 50 RPM. Then the next checkpoint was to go to 2500 RPM a couple of days later, and that's where there was a little glitch. There was a timing glitch in the software package that 
that was going to let us transition from the lower RPM up to full speed to flight mode. And so that's what um, that's what delayed the first flight by about a week. And while the the folks here on Earth and at JPL worked that software, came up with two different solutions and uh, deployed the simplest of the two, but have the other one as a backup plan uh, in order to fly that first time this week. So um, April 19th, the first flight, as I said, it was about 39 seconds. So it flew autonomously and we landed successfully. So, you know, landing on Mars is a little dicey because there, it's very rocky so that it, the helicopter, you know, is supposed to go back to its takeoff point where we, we know that it's a safe landing spot and return and land. And that's what it did the first flight. It also did that the second flight uh, yesterday where it went five meters up. It went then two meters in the lateral direction, hovered, it uh, turned and returned. And it acquired some photographs with the color camera. Those have not yet back to us. They're supposed to come back sometime today. Uh, that was about 52 seconds. And then on Sunday right now, it's projected we'll have the third flight. Um, again, we, we have to you know, be flexible. It, it, it happens when it happens, but that's uh, the current projection is for Sunday. And in this one, it'll go the five meter hover, then to a 50 meter a lateral out and 50 meter back. So 100 meter total flight. And I'll just end with show some of the anticipated operations of the ingenuity. All right, so I guess I should ask uh, Sierra if we have any questions. We do. First off, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. This is all very exciting work. So we have a few questions in the chat that we will start off with. First, Vicki Cox said, can you describe coordination with FAA on advanced air mobility? Sure, there's a lot of different areas where we're working with the FAA uh, in the AAM area. We've got uh, established working groups in in aircraft, in airspace, and in, in the national campaign with the FAA. So our airspace folks particularly have worked, always worked very closely with the FAA in terms of how to get new airspace systems and new operational aspects into the uh, national airspace system. Uh, as well, with we are working with this, both the certification parts of the FAA and the FAA Tech Center. So there's a lot. There is a lot of collaboration uh, between us. Uh, NASA is not a, a sort of you know regulatory agency. So we we are our role is to provide the the data and the information that then the FAA can use to establish their uh, their certification and regulation policy issues. 
Great. Next we have Bruce Tenney said, has NASA abandoned conventional rotorcraft R&D? Is all of RVLT focused exclusively on EVOL VTOL advanced air mobility? Um, so I think abandoned is a little strong word there, Bruce, but um, the we are focused exclusively on targeting, focusing our disciplines to the AAM mission right now. But like many things, you know, as we work, say, acoustics for advanced air mobility, those same acoustic tools and knowledge uh, can be translated to the conventional rotorcraft. So what I'm hoping is that, and what we are, are trying to do, is to keep our discipline skills sharp, but we are focused uh, almost exclusively on the, the AAM mission. And it's not necessarily all electric VTOL, there's also a, a hybrid electric component in there. Great, we have another question from Bruce. He said, how does industry get exposure to the specific research and results from the RVLT research? Is there any contracted research or is it all NASA in-house? Uh, we do have contracted research uh, and, and in most cases are able to publish the results of those contracts as NASA contract reports. And that's our goal is to have those results available uh, and in the you know, the same with our in-house research we strive to make that available through a wide range of publications of conferences and of, of uh, access that way so next we have david meyer from boeing said Hi, Susan. Is Rover to Ingenuity Com strictly line of sight? Will Ingenuity return Rover as a default if necessary? Um, it it is line of sight, and the uh, uh, it will not get close to to the rover. So um, basically, at the end of the thirty day window, so we call it the month of Ingenuity, um, but at the thirty at the 30 day mark, the rover is going to drive away and continue its scientific mission on Mars. And at that point, the helicopter will no longer be able to communicate to Earth. So we've got these days to do the demonstration, but then there's no, no plan to continue with uh, contacting Ingenuity because the rover will have moved away from it. Uh, so this one's not as much of a question, but more of a comment. Mike Hirschberger said, that was awesome. Thanks so much for Susan and the chapter for an excellent meeting. Ingenuity is the next cover story for the next issue of Vertiflight, Flight, which is very exciting. All right. <laughs> so then we have Mark Motter said, what are the wind limits for Ingenuity? Yes, you know, I, I would have to go back to the very uh, early days when we calculated that, and I just I just don't remember what that is. Uh, I'm sorry, Mark. No worries. So Delaney Jordan then said, what will happen to Ingenuity after the rover leaves? Yes, well, it, it, um, it won't be able to communicate, so its job will be done, right? And so it will remain on the surface. And we will be looking at what's our next mission and how to design, you know, the next air vehicle uh, to support the next mission. So now Mark Roast said, I noticed that batteries are not prioritized. Is that because you don't expect any near term progress? Your Cyber STTR said, had said the tipping point to go to full battery electric commercial passenger aircraft is 700 and we are targeting to in a safe, inexpensive ceramic battery. So um, the battery research is not prioritized within my project uh, and not overall uh, battery development is not, tar is not uh, prioritized within NASA because the Department of Energy has so much other gov U.S. government investment in batteries. And so we look to that other agency 
for the research in the, the batteries. Now, what we do look at within NASA is given a battery and its capabilities, how, what, what do we have to do in terms of aviation to install that battery or operationally use that battery to the best of its capability? Uh, there's a lot of work that's not in the advanced air mobility mission, but is in the subsonic transport and uh, larger vehicle sustainability missions where we're, we're looking at, can you go to larger vehicles and have those be uh, some type of hybrid electric uh, or alternative power? Apologize if I misread any of these as the questions come in, they keep scrolling down. Um, so then Mark also asked, is there any possibility of funding for development of non-lithium batteries? Uh, we have very limited funding for the, as I said, for the development of uh, batteries with, within NASA aeronautics. Um, there is you know, pa power uh, research on the space side, but that tends to be more oh, towards the uh, uh, nuclear or uh, options. So I would not say there is that, that real possibility for uh, that kind of funding. So then Michael Fallon said, understand Ingenuity has a piece of the right flyer on it. Can you tell more your ideas? Will a piece of the Sikorsky VS300 be next? All right, uh, Mike, you're, you're right. The Ingenuity does have a piece of fabric from a lower wing of the original right flyer. And it this, this small piece of fabric was put underneath the solar panel of Ingenuity. And I wish that had been my idea, but but it wasn't. Um, I think the the folks at at, at headquarters managed to uh, to sneak that in on some of us. So uh, uh, I'll suggest to them that the VS three hundred could could be next. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mark Roast added uh, two thousand watt hours per kilogram modular IoT included hybrid solar battery. Yeah, that's not a question. That's a, a statement, I think, for his uh, his configuration. Yes, I think that was. Um, so then, uh, I think the next a lot of oh, we're getting a lot of thank yous. And then, someone said, "What is LARC NASA doing about liquid hydrogen for VTOLs?" Um, well, we've looked uh, looked at different concepts. Um, we haven't looked. You know too much about liquid liquid hydrogen. I think that's from Bud. Um, but we are following what's going on in, uh, particularly in the, you know the the VFS uh, committee on hydrogen, and then there's a lot of work in the transport uh, arena on hydrogen. So basically, we're following that right now. I would say more so than than putting it mainstream for us. So I see a lot a lot of other comments coming in. I'm going to just move on to the questions, but I appreciate everyone's uh, gratitude for the event. Uh, Bruce said, uh, last question from him. Do you see NASA returning to prototype flights anytime soon? Well, so I. I uh, didn't mean to say that NASA was not flying uh, um, prototypes. So we do have the X-57, which is a distributed electric propulsion uh, fixed wing kind of plane based on a Technum design that's flying out at, or, or should be flying out at Armstrong uh, in the fall. And then we have the X-59 uh, flight demonstrator, which is to demonstrate a low boom supersonic design. We've got feelers out about doing subsonic transport demonstrations, but what we are 
what we're not planning on doing right now is developing a NASA design prototype to fly for UAM. And that's partly because there are so many people designing and flying that there's no real requirement to, to, for NASA to show it can be done. We're, we're seeing it done all the time. So the question is, how can we, how can we help those configurations in their next iteration? How, what are they going to need down the road that we can give them and get ready so that when they ask that question, we'll, be, uh, we'll, be, we'll have an answer for them? That's more what we're, we're looking at. All right, I am not seeing any additional questions. Uh, if anyone has any last minute questions. Oh, I see one. Oh, OK, a few more are coming in. <laughs> um, so one said comment on using hydrogen powered VTOL to distribute the liquid hydrogen to other places. Yeah, I, I actually don't have any comment on that. I haven't looked at that topic at all. All right, Ed Austin asked who designed the rotor? So the rotor was mainly designed by AeroVironment. Um, they had a basic design when they came to us with the feasibility. Uh, what, what NASA did is, is, I guess would say touch it up um, in terms of evaluating it for aeroelastic and controllability um, kind of uh, assessments. So the the but in general, it was designed by Aero Environment. Great. I think that's all the questions that are in the chat. Uh, does anyone have any last minute questions? Uh, I am not seeing, so actually Mitch Maddox said, can the remote helicopter be loaded back into the rover for a faster charge, reducing the two day charge time and also keeping it warm? So uh, no, Ingenuity cannot be, uh, cannot be used that way. Uh, and by design, it was to, it, it was as a technology demonstrator is completely separate from the Perseverance rover mission. So the, the rover scientists and the rover program wanted it to make sure that the helicopter, uh, if it had a problem or if it had a failure, would not interfere with the rover's mission. So it had to be com completely live on its own once it got to the surface. Now, Will there be other designs that that could be more, I guess I would say, more coupled to the rover? And that may be the case in the future. You know, once you can prove that the helicopter is stable, that it's controllable, that you understand what it's going to do. And, you know, let's face it, we don't want the helicopter to crash into the rover on Mars, right? I mean, the, the rover's mission is the primary mission. So um, everything had to be done that would preserve the rover's mission and at the same time allow us to be able to demonstrate the helicopter's mission. So future designs may operate differently, but in this particular design, it, it cannot go back. Great, I think we have given everyone plenty of time for questions. We really, really appreciate uh, this presentation and then this follow up discussion. I think it has been very informative and enjoyable for everyone. All right. Well, thanks very much for asking me uh, again. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Sierra, for arranging this. So I uh, appreciate it. Thanks for everybody for listening. Of course. Thank you all so much for joining. Uh, Matt, do you have any uh, additional comments to add? No, just if you want a copy of the presentation or slides, um, let us know. And you know, thank you everyone for attending. We got a lot of representation from all across the country and the world. Uh, Susan, I think you did a great job. So thank you very much. And um, you know, just reach out if anyone has any questions. All right. Thanks, everybody. Great. Thank you all. Bye bye.